So Mary, from what Dean's just said, it sounds like you knew before he did, long before he did, that he needed help and that you could not offer the professional support that he needed. He was going to need to see a, a, a clinician. When yeah. What were the signs for you that made it clear to you that he needed help way before he, he could fit, uh, realise it? I think the only way, looking back, that Dean was able to cope with the trauma that he'd experienced was to become numb, not to show anything, any cracks in the facade. So in a way, he... I, he well he did isolate himself from the family from me um and was very much the sort of tough journalist and um at home of course we'd have we'd have great times you know we'd watch movies we'd laugh but there was certain territory that we didn't um traverse um but of course privately I was at my wits end because this person wasn't my husband and we we didn't know about trauma it's okay to talk about PTSD but you have to understand trauma and yeah. um, I think trauma maybe in our generation of journalists was considered a bit of a a, a weakness um, we, we were tough and you know you'd tell stories around um, you know over the bar or something of you know someone's latest you know, exploits and getting pictures and getting photos and getting stories. So I, I don't remember trauma ever being talked about. And then suddenly there's this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And when, when I was at my wits end, I went to talk to a friend who's a psychologist and she said, um, Dean has, you know, um, PTSD. And I'd, I'd never really heard of it. Um, so I had a big job to... Um, to try and get Dean to understand. I mean, Dean, Dean is trying to preserve his sanity. Um, so he's moving away from us, whereas I'm sort of running after him saying, you have this condition, don't panic. Um, mm. You've been under a lot of trauma or you've faced a lot of trauma, you've experienced a lot of trauma. Your body is just telling you something. Um, I don't even think I was that articulate. Um and of course, you know, in self-protection, I think Dean sort of thought, no, 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 I'm all right. I can cope. And so it took it, it took time. It took time. And if I could do it again, I'd do it better. You know, uh, I, I work in the area of trauma now. And the first, the first thing you ever tell people is you're safe. You're safe. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not mad, you're not bad, you're safe. And um, I think the conversation is so much easier these days um, because journalism there then was was different you you did take risks and you didn't think about the actual um, psychological uh, psychological risks to yourself yeah I think one of the other things as well to deal was that I was we were living in Tasmania right mm. I mean how far away from a war zone could you get and so I'm I'm, I'm how could I be unwell so that that mm. that that helped mm. foster that denial that there could be anything wrong Mm, and it yeah. had been years since I'd been in a war zone. How could there be anything wrong? Mm. Yeah, you know the, I mean? prob the problem with PTSD is it's not logical, though, is it? And and exactly. it's this and it's this it's this delayed onset thing, which we didn't understand. We'd never heard of. And then could say I'm fine, but then someone would drop a cup or yeah. slam a door, or, or or Dean would have nightmares. You know. Yeah. Um, so you you know something's not right, but then the logic of it is, well, I'll get it better now because I'm, I'm away. A, I'm home. Yeah, right, I yeah. can get better. So when you're trying to help someone, it, it's very hard. You yeah. needed as many experts around you as you could, um, yeah. but there weren't many in Tasmania. No. Yeah. So, D Dean, the, the way you described it just then was that you didn't think there was anything wrong with you. And then Mary convinced you to go and see a psychiatrist. And within 45 minutes, they'd given you a diagnosis. So that yep. seems very quick, which suggests that they were pretty sure that yes. you presented all the signs. That must have been a sudden awakening for you. You did say you had to kind of emotionally come to terms with the with your diagnosis. It does. I've spoken to some people who sometimes, when they've had any diagnosis, feel a sense of relief that the diagnosis explains what hasn't made sense to them about themselves. Did, was there any of that, or was it? Were you just in denial? And because 
the culture in journalism has changed a lot. I, I recognize what you and Mary are saying about the old fashioned culture that journalists are hard. We go into trouble when everyone else is running away from it. And, you know, journalists certainly do not identify themselves as traumatized people. In fact, um, in the resilience program, we launched a trauma therapy fund and we had to drop the word trauma because nobody applied. <laughs> And then we had to drop the word therapy and we had to just call it professional psychological support because the the the, the sort of language had such yeah. weight and such kind yeah. of prejudice. You know, journalists aren't traumatized. It's the, the people we interview are traumatized. Oh, They've had oh. really traumatic lives. We're fine. We're like the lucky ones, you know. So and and I don't think there's there was certainly the culture of bravado the the bravado in journalism is is certainly a cultural thing and let's face it the culture of substance misuse and drink and yeah. you know knock, knocking it knocking it away with a couple of drinks at the end of the day kind of thing i definitely think yeah. things have changed now but I'm i mean look, when, I got, when, I got the, when i got the diagnosis intellectually i understood it but emotionally i didn't accept it uh at the time and this was crucial. I, I only understood this later when I had my first psych ward admission. But when I got the diagnosis, I went on sick leave. And I just I just didn't, um, when, I'm, when I say I didn't emotionally accept it, I didn't inquire into the diagnosis. I didn't read about it. I didn't, and I wasn't getting any, um, I was just seeing a psychiatrist once a month who didn't really get me. I wasn't getting any actual therapy uh and all i did was just what i actually did was i just started going bushwalking and and i started sort of basically disappearing into the rainforest and so i wasn't really i wasn't really tackling the the, the diagnosis per se i was avoiding it and um and and as a result of going on sick leave and not working and and i this is when i really started to isolate myself i started to go downhill even further and the fact that i was isolating myself not working i'd lost that structure of work my work day uh my brain now was freed up even was was quite mm -hmm. free the, the the traumatic memories really started to bubble up and this just made me worse uh and so i found myself actually having more nightmares more mm -hmm. flashbacks Mm -hmm. and completely confused as to why this was going on why this was happening and that's when I got to the point of um of being suicidal because the the pain of all this just was was insurmountable Mary was trying to get me into crisis programs on the mainland that were were just booked out for months uh she was trying to get me into a psychologist who specialized in this and of course there were just no resources in Tasmania for this sort of thing um and eventually I, I got to the point where i was suicidal and mary said you need to be hospitalized you know you've reached that you've reached that point of despair yeah. mm. and that was that was that was sort of i guess that was the turning point really when i realized i was in crisis and i needed to tackle this thing yeah and, I, and that's I, when you accepted to go to um sign yourself into ward 17 wasn't it correct mm. yeah I, at the time, was working with um, refugees and asylum seekers, and um, I began to notice that these people who'd been through extreme events, there was some sort of correlation between what was happening in my home and mm. what had happened to these people um, and, and the sort of trauma and, and the nightmares, yeah. um, the uh, avoidance, um, and... Yeah, I, I think that um, at the time was um, really gave me an insight. Yeah, it certainly sounds like your new role, your new work role, Mary, supporting refugees mm -hmm. and with along with the obvious education you must have had at that time of understanding trauma and major events and being much yes. more fluent in that language of psychological mm -hmm. safety and trauma would have allowed you to see parallels between your yes. husband and your patients or your clients. 